Bless you. Thank you. Morning, everyone. It's fantastic to be back with you. So I always love coming to this church because it's like a church after my own heart. <laughs> and I know Ken's away this morning, and we pray that God's blessing will be upon him. And we thank God for your pastor. Would you say amen? Because, you know, I think of the affiliation that I have with this place, and especially with Ken and other men, Gary, different men in this place, is that you know, it's not a church that chooses either or. It's a church of the word and the spirit. Would you say amen? And we need that constantly in our lives, brothers and sisters. If you do have a Bible with you, could you turn with me, please, to John chapter 16 this morning? John chapter 16. Very important subject to bring to you. Subject that you can't revisit too often. Subject that's vital for each of us as Christians and as a church as a whole. I want to talk about the person and work of the Holy Spirit. Verse 5 then. The Lord Jesus is the speaker and he says, But now I go away to him who sent me. And none of, me, none of you asks me, Where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your hearts. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it's to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and judgment, of sin because they do not believe in me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more, of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will tell you of things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said, he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. Could we pray together, please? Father, we're so in need of your spirit this morning. We hear the words of Jesus saying, apart from me, you can accomplish absolutely nothing. And Lord, this is vital, this subject that I'm about to approach. And I pray that, Father, I wanted to come home with power today. I pray that your people would go out, built up in their most holy faith, encouraged to go on with you in these Last days, speak, I pray. Shut us in with yourself, Holy Spirit. Have free course in this place. Lord, there may well be someone sitting here that is still halting between two opinions, still outside the safety of Christ, still on the road to a lost eternity. I pray that he would come and convict of sin, for righteousness and judgment to come. Glorify the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. For it's in his name that we ask these things. Amen. Amen. Listen, if you will, to this profound statement by a Christian writer called Dorothy Sayers. She says, and I quote, there are those who focus on the Father, the Son, and the Holy Scriptures. Those who found their faith on the Father, the Son, and the Church. And there are even those who seem to derive their spiritual power from the Father, the Son, and their minister. <laughs> what a revealing statement 
Of course, it's not completely true, but in another sense, it's at least partly true. For what this lady was trying to say is that quite often, with some believers and in some denominations of the evangelical church, for various reasons, whether out of fear, misunderstanding, tradition, the Holy Spirit is not given the worship, adoration, and indeed the recognition that He fully deserves. Commenting on this fact, another Christian writer called Carl Bates, Bates says, if the Holy Spirit were to be taken out of our midst today, 95% of what we are doing would still go on. And you know, I feel she's right. For so often the modern Christian feels he or she can get by without the Spirit's influence in their life. Yet, look at the early church, brothers and sisters. If you were to remove the Holy Spirit from their midst, 95% of what they were doing would have ceased immediately, and everyone would have known the difference. It's important that we live our Christian lives to the full, and in order to do so, it's vital that we have a right understanding of how important the Holy Spirit is to each of us as individuals and as a church Hence the reason this morning I want to do a short study under the heading, The Person and Work of the Holy Spirit. So let's just do that. The first thing I want you to grasp this morning is this, is that He is a person. Let me just stress to you, we're not talking about a doctrine. We're talking about a person when you say Amen. The reason I point this out is because some Christians subconsciously view him as a power source that flows from the Father and the Son, but forget that he himself is the third person of the Godhead. It's easy for us to think of the Father as a person, isn't it? Because although no man has seen God at any time, we can almost picture him as the figurehead upon the throne. It's certainly easy to, to consider that the Son is a person because he, he, he came in human flesh. He lived amongst us that perfect life and He died that atoning death and rose to the right hand of the Father again. But the Spirit of his, as a person is not so easy to grasp or imagine in the mind. This is partly due to the fact that in the Scriptures He's manifest in different forms and symbols. For instance, in Acts chapter 2, He's seen as fire. There appeared unto them cloven tongues as of fire. Why fire? Because fire purifies this morning. And that's what the Holy Spirit did to those early believers, and that's what He will do with each of us when He comes in power. In John chapter 4, and then in John chapter 7, He's described as water. Why water? Because water quenches your thirst. <laughs> There's Christians and they're thirsting after other things. But I tell you, when the Holy Spirit comes in power, He will give you a thirst for the things of Christ. John chapter 3, and again in Acts chapter 2, He's described as a wind. There, there appeared unto them a mighty wind. Why wind? Because you know what I found? Wind invigorates you. <laughs> wind thrusts you forward. And that's what happened to those early disciples. They went out of that upper room and they were thrust forward with a mighty power. And that's what will happen to us when He comes in power in our lives. In other scriptures, He's described as oil. He's described as a dove, and so on and so forth. Sometimes given us the impression that He is some sort of power source, but we must remember that He is a person. Further proofs of this are found in the text that we read. Eleven times our Lord Jesus, if you looked at the text again, you would find that He speaks of the Spirit, not as a net, but He. Again, still more proofs can be found that the Holy Spirit is a person and that He has His own thoughts. Acts 15, verse 28, For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay no greater burden than these necessary things. A mere power source or influence cannot think for themselves, but a person can. The Holy Spirit can speak this morning. Acts 8, 29, Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join yourself unto the chariot. A mere power source or influence cannot speak, but a person can. The Holy Spirit can act this morning. Acts 8, 39, And when they were come up into the water, the Spirit called Philip away, that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. The Spirit has feelings. 
as well. Ephesians 4 verses 30 tells us it's possible, and listen to this, this is amazing, it's possible for us to grieve him or stem him. I pray that that wouldn't be the case with any of us. Acts chapter 5, verse 3 to 5, shows us that he can be lied to, the story of Ananias and Sapphira. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 19, shows us it's possible to quench him from moving. And this happens when we deny his power. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 11, tells us that the Spirit has his own will. Brothers and sisters, these are all proofs that he's a person and not an influence. Now, why is this important, Stuart? Give us so many proof texts. Well, I'll tell you why it's important. And, and we know this, but I just want to bring it home to you again as it's come home to me these last weeks. It's important that I stress this point simply to remind us that methods, communication skills, imaginative strategies, good presentation, and so on, all these things that many modern churches seek after today are good in and of themselves. Would you say amen to that? There's nothing wrong with that. But they are not at the same time in and of themselves enough to thrust the church forward and reach the lost. Listen to A.W. Tozer. He says, The only power that God recognizes in His church is the power of the Spirit, whereas the only power recognized today by the modern church is the power of man. God does His work by the power of the Spirit, while preachers today endeavor to do theirs by the power of the trained and devoted intellect. Bright personality has taken place of divine affluitus. Everything that men do in their own strength and by their own abilities is done for time alone. The quality of eternity is not in it. Only what is done through the eternal spirit will abide eternally. And then he says this, it is a solemn thought to think that many of us who thought ourselves to be Important evangelicals may on the last day find that we have been busy harvesters of stubble. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, I would go as far as to say to you that the church right throughout the UK has changed. The church has turned to gimmicks. Whatever happened to the sovereignty of God, the Holy Spirit, would you say amen to that? And I know that the church that I'm preaching to this morning is different. And that's why I thank God for the leader here, because he's a pastor who holds to the Word of God. But he's a pastor who depends completely on the sovereignty of God, the Holy Spirit, to work. Would you say amen to that? And brothers and sisters, I just want to remind you again that all of these things are good, but it's a person that we need. See, in my own private prayer times, I've been crying out for him, because it's him that makes the difference. Now that we've looked at point one, he's a person, I want you to look at other, four other points with me. I want you to look at four other points underneath the work of the Holy Spirit. Here's the first work of the Holy Spirit. The first work of the Holy Spirit and the chief office of the Holy Spirit is to promote Jesus Christ. Chapter 16, verse 14, the Lord Jesus said, He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine, and will declare it unto you. Please understand that when the Holy Spirit is at work, yes, he's worthy of worship. Yes, he's worthy of adoration. Yes, he's worthy of praise because he's the third person of the Godhead. But when he's at work, he doesn't primarily point people to himself. He always points them to Jesus Christ. It's important that we recognize this. For I have found more and more that Christians are being confused by what's taking place in the confines of the church and in Christendom as a whole. Questions they ask is, how can I know what's authentic and what is not? How can I know who is authentic and who is not? Well, here's a good rule of thumb. Ask yourself the question, in that person, in that church, in that revival, is God glorified? Is he at the center do they have a love for Jesus Christ? Does their life emanate Christ? Does their lips speak of his praise? Do they have a hunger for his word? Do they desire to tell others? Are they committed to serving him? These are all proofs of a, per a personal experience without these characteristics as meaningless and counterfeit. Would you say amen to that? 
And this is why I'm so burdened these days. Because the church has turned away from these things. You know, brothers and sisters, I, I'm not sure where I've mentioned here before, but a few years ago I took some of my friends to a, a, a prominent church over in England. And I'll not mention who it was. But I got up in 25 minutes. This guy got up and gave a motiv- motivational chat. And he never bothered to open the Bible. And then he comes off with the audacious statement that we ought to move on from the cross. <laughs> and there's over 2,000 people are drawn to this place. And I thought, this is not, this is not the Holy Spirit. I actually was getting up in the pulpit to preach one morning at Living Hope Church in Hull, and um, there was a certain revival going on over in Florida. And I declared to our people that this thing is not of God. I was lambasted for it. <laughs> South African girl come up to me and she says, me and my father are leaving. We're going over to Lakeland to get the blessing and bring it back. I said, the blessing's here. You don't need to go to Lakeland. We're not coming back. You're too negative. Six months later, that so-called revival, the leader of it was having an affair with one of his secretaries. Some revival. The young girl came in. She said, apologize, pastor. I got it wrong. I was getting calls from my own friends in Scotland, godly people, by the way, saying, Stuart, why don't you go on a plane with us and come over? <laughs> my heart's breaking. The point is, where is the discernment in the body of Christ? Paul said, this is the gospel that was handed down to me from God. This gospel I declared for you, to you, Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. He was buried according to the Scriptures, and on the third day, He rose according to the Scriptures. The first work of God, the Holy Spirit, and I want to help you again with this this morning, is to promote Christ. If Christ is not the center, you know that there's something's not right. Secondly, not only does He promote Christ, the Holy Spirit will always purify, purify. Think about His name. He's called the Holy Spirit. Speaks of his purity and his nature and a purity in his activity. John 16, 8, I've quoted already. When he has come, he will reprove the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Brothers and sisters, it's clear that his work is to purify. Think about 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9 to 11. Listen to what Paul says. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves of mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Now listen to this. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, sanctified, and justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Note Paul says that the Corinthians were in the past tense negative category, but note how they were washed, sanctified, and justified. It was through the purifying work of God the Holy Spirit. The true Christian this morning will be one in which the Spirit has begun and continues to do that that purifying work. Would you say amen? amen? No sanctification, no justification. Because the two go hand in hand. Can I challenge you, church? Are we living clean this morning? Oh, I know that Christians can fall. Many of us have fallen over the years. And that's fine, but as long as we get up and keep going on, would you say amen to that? But if you, over years and years and years, are struggling with the same sins, going into the same old haunts, dealing with people and, and, and hanging with people that you should not be, you need to ask yourself the question this morning, are you a Christian? Because the Holy Spirit does that sanctifying and purifying work in the true believer. Challenge to you this morning, church. So he promotes Christ. Let's remember that. The Holy Spirit also purifies. We ought to be living clean lives these days. But then I want you to see also, thirdly, that he empowers. He empowers. In three ways. The first way he empowers is that he preserves life. The Holy Spirit preserves life. Psalm 104, 30. You sent forth your spirit and they are created. You renewed the face of the earth. Job 34, 14 and 15. If he set his heart upon man, if he gathered unto himself his spirit and breath, all flesh shall perish together and man shall turn again unto the dust. 
Job 33, 4, the Spirit of God has made me and the breath of the Almighty has given me life. Note again, it seems here that by the empowering work of the third person, we have creation and preservation. You know what I find more and more these days, men and women dishonor God. They're ignorant of the fact that it's only because of his common grace that they even have breath in their bodies. As we come here this morning, he is upholding our very breath. He's given us our very breath. Unsee a friend in this house. It's his common grace that keeps you alive. The reason your eyes are open, the reason your heart is beating is because the third person of God has preserved you to live another day. What if, as Job says, he was to gather unto himself that same breath? Can I ask you a question? Are you prepared to meet your God? Are you prepared to meet your God? Oh, Stuart, I'll have the three score years and ten. Doesn't always happen that way. Do you remember the stories I've told you? In Albury one night in East Yorkshire, I told a man walking out the door after four people responded, you need to get right with God. Young man, I really enjoyed what you had to say, but I'll leave it to next week. That midweek, he took a massive heart attack in his driveway and was launched it into eternity. God took him, and he wasn't right with God. It's just a challenge to those who are not Christians this morning. He preserves life. And you know, brothers and sisters, this is the day that the Lord has made. Would you say amen? amen? The very fact that he's given you breath in your body is so that we can praise him today. <coughs> Do not think that that same spirit that's preserving your very breath today is going to keep you every day of your life. It's going to meet your every need. I tell you, he will. But then there's a second empowering, and I love this. Not only does he preserve life, But this empowering, this second empowering is that he gives new life to the Christian. I know your pastor's been doing Bible studies on this particular theme this last way back because I've been listening to them. (laughs) Brothers and sisters, how is it that you came to become a Christian? And why is it that you get up each day and have any desire at all for God? I tell you, it's not because of your own desire or power. It's because of the power of the third person of the Godhead that you're able to come to him in the first place and that you're able to go on with him. Paul says in Ephesians 2, 1, and you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and in sins. Paul says there was a time when we were spiritually dead and incapable of coming to God, but out of love and through the work of the third person, he awakened us from our dead state. And I know there's different points of view in the church as to how this happened. There's a point of view that says, well, we analogy that I heard, and I thought it was brilliant, uh, that somehow, you, you know, salvation and us coming to Christ is like this. It's like God in the, in the lifeboat, and he throws out the ring with a rope on it, and we're struggling, 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 and out of our own free choice, we take the, take the, the life raft, hold on to it, and he pulls us to safety. Brothers and sisters, that is not how we come to God. Let me tell you where we were. We were a swollen corpse at the bottom of the ocean. (laughs) Already dead. Do you know what happened? Speaking reverently, the Savior delved into the ocean, swam to the bottom, pulled our corpse to the top, took us to land, and the Spirit of God breathed life into us, and we become a new creature in Christ. That's what happened in our salvation. We ought to be a thankful people because of this this morning. Would you say amen? I'll tell you why. Because the same spirit that has empowered us to live and causes us to believe is the same spirit that promises to keep us every day until we get to glory. Paul was a missionary, wasn't he? And he went plant, a church planter as well, went planting churches in, all around Asia and into Europe. And Paul had to move on from many churches, but one church that he really loved was the Philippian church. They were always helping him out, no matter where he went. And Paul writes to them in Philippians 2 and 12. And he says this, Wherefore, my beloved, as you've always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. In other words, I don't always need to be there for you. Why? Here's what he says, because it's God that works in you, both to will and to do his good pleasure. God is is, is preserving you. He's helping you persevere and he's with you every day. Someone says, I would love to be a Christian, 
You heard this saying, but I can't keep it. <laughs> the reality is, brothers and sisters, and the reality is, friend, you can't keep it. He keeps you. <laughs> Calvin called it the perseverance of the saints. Some other scholars have called it the preservation of the saints. Think about this. Every day we awake, even when we're sleeping, we're being kept by a power that we can't even imagine. I just glory in that fact. Now we can sing with gratitude. Thank you, O my Father, for giving us your Son and leaving your Spirit until the work on earth is done. So he preserves life. He gives the Christian new life and he helps the Christian persevere to the end. Oh, praise God for the Holy Spirit. But then there's another way that he empowers. And this is where I want to really zoom in because this is where my heart goes out to the church. He empowers for service, for service. Acts chapter one, verse eight. But you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem and Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. The word power in the Greek there is dunamis. And it means dynamite. Here Christ says when the Spirit comes, they would receive explosive power, not for salvation. And I'm fed up hearing that there's only one baptism. There's two baptisms, would you say amen? Power not for salvation, but he was talking here about power for service. The word dunamis occurs nine times in Acts, and nearly in all of those occasions it means to empower not only to serve, but for healing as well. And I tell you, when the Spirit comes... He can bring power for effective service, but he also brings power for healing. Now, does God heal everybody? Big subject. I don't personally believe that he does because I believe that God can even be glorified in our suffering. Would you say amen to that? But God still does heal today. I believe that with all of my heart. We need disempowering. I need disempowering. My ministry, we need it in our witness. I finish, someone says, Stuart, I want the Spirit to work in me, but how can I receive it? Through heartfelt, persevering prayer. Acts chapter 1, 4, and being assembled together with them, he commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father which said he, you've heard of me. The Greek word for the word wait is, meaning for the word wait here in verse 4, means to hang around, (laughs) to endure. Notice no specific times were given, brothers and sisters, just a promise that if they would endure, if they would wait, then great power would be made available to them. This required patience, didn't it? Do you know what I find interesting? Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 6 tells us that after Christ's resurrection, he appeared unto more than 500 of his brethren at one time. So they seen the risen Christ. That would have been awesome. But by the time we get to Acts chapter 2, there's only 120 left in the upper room. Now my mind started thinking, where do the other 380 go to? And then I thought, well, probably the upper room, as big as it was, wasn't able to contain all of them. And then the scripture came to me, but God doesn't dwell in temples made with hands. It's not that the God, the Holy Spirit, was restricted to that upper room. If those other 300 plus were, were hungry enough, he could have went and met with them as well, and perhaps he did. But all we were told here is that the 120 received the promise. And the point is this, the best, the most powerful anointing comes for those who are willing to wait in his presence. Daniel was three times a week in prayer. Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are. That's a scripture telling us he was no different to us. But he prayed earnestly. And we see part of his prayer life on the top of Mount Carmel. Would not give in until the answers came. Our Lord himself, we're told, 
prayed long hours, sometimes all through the night. And in case you think that he had a sort of a timid way about him, that wasn't the Lord Jesus. The writer of the Hebrews, speaking of Christ's prayer life, said, in the days of his flesh, he offered up strong cries unto God and was heard because of his godly fear. I think this is what differentiates differentiates the church today from the church of yesteryear. This is why they seen great revivals and we don't. This is why they dwarf us. It wasn't that they had less distractions or more crosses to bear. It was that they had learned to persevere with God. George Whitfield's quote, whole days and weeks have I spent in prostrate prayer before the throne of God. John Pollock has a book that I read on Whitfield and Wesley. These men were mighty in prayer. He used to to lie all night in Oxford and pray and pray and pray, and then God came in in power. It's no coincidence then that 25% of the nation was swept into the kingdom of God under these men's ministries. Martin Luther, the father of the Reformation, was legendary for his prayer life. He spent two hours a day in prayer. One day he said to Philip Melanchthon, his right-hand man, "Um, Philip, I have so much to do tomorrow that I need to spend an extra hour in prayer today. (laughs) Now, let's be honest. I'm talking about myself here as well. We do the exact opposite, don't we? The more we have going on, the less we pray. These men were different. They knew their need of the Spirit of God. They knew that if they could spend that time with him, then there'd be more fruit born in the little time that they had left. They tell me Luther prayed aloud because he said, I want even the devil to hear me praying. Philip Melanchthon, his right-hand man, came around the corner one day to hear Luther storm the throne of grace. Listen to what he said. He stopped, listened, went back to his room and wrote in his diary. Listen to what he said. Gracious God, with what spirit What reverence, and yet with what holy familiarity does Brother Luther pray? John Calvin was also a great man of prayer. He writes in his commentary that it's good for us to set aside certain hours for prayer. Not minutes, but hours. And yet, the thing that's throughout about these men today is that after they were dry, (laughs) these men were mighty prayer warriors. Calvin from Geneva sent hundreds of missionaries out right throughout Europe. Notice, not minutes, but hours. No wonder God moved mightily in their lives. John Welsh, the son-in-law of John Knox, prayed several hours a day. His wife, after he died, testified of how never there was a night went by when he wasn't in his cold side room in northern Scotland pouring out his heart to God. She used to go because she was worried about him. No electric in those days. It would have been freezing. Northern Scotland, you better believe it would have been freezing. She used to go to the door, and out of reverence, she'd have knocked it, and she said, John, sweetheart, do you not think you should come to bed in case you catch a cold? And out came the, the, the response from behind the door, and this is the lady's testimony. He used to say, my dear, I have the care of 3,000 souls, and I do not know how it is with many of them. It's no wonder that this man had 3,000 of a church. He was mighty in prayer. 1651, there was a group of ministers in the Church of Scotland who got together because they lost their hunger for prayer. And in their meeting, they wrote up a mutual confession, confessing their sins. And the document, number, number 12 of that document, addressed their prayerlessness. And this is what it said as I close. We have not been men of prayer. The spirit of prayer has slumbered amongst us. The closet has been too little frequented and delighted in. Why so much speaking and so little prayer? Why so much business and yet so little prayer? Why so many meetings with others and yet so few with God? For it is in coming out fresh with communion with God that we go forth to do His work successfully. It is in the closet we get our vessels so filled with blessing that when we come forth, we cannot contain it, but must have a necessity. Pour it out wherever we go. What am I saying? These men 
knew the importance of prayer. That's why they had this empowering brothers and sisters. And this is our pattern today. Now, I know I'm speaking to a church that is driven by prayer. I think that's a wonderful thing. There may be someone here say, well, Stuart, that's not my cup of tea. Well, that's fine. But there might, the reason I'm bringing this sermon this morning is because there might be those of us who want to really press in with God. Do you say amen to that? Amen. Brothers and sisters, I want to tell you there's rivers to swim in. There's rivers to swim in. And the reason I say this is not because I just see it in Scripture, but I felt it in my own life. If I can finish just telling you my story in regards to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Remember, in Scotland, when I was playing for Motherwell, I was sitting under a man called George McKim's ministry, and George used to stir me up because this man used to bring it in the spirit every week. And I went home and I said to my wife, I need more. I want this baptism, this filling, whatever way you want to um, label it. And so Laura was going to Glasgow to do a college course at the time, and when she was going out, I used to put the blinds down in the living room. I used to get on my knees and I used to cry to God for hours. And over those first few hours, God started to deal with me about things in my life that weren't right, things that I needed to put in place. And you see, before this empowering comes, there always needs to be obedience and surrender. Sorry for getting way laid, but this is the reason many Christians never get this full empowering, because they're not willing to give up their idols. Would you say amen? But God started to deal with me and said, would you get rid of that? And will you get rid of that? And will you sort that out? Will you sort your attitude out? And I said, yes, Lord. And days then went into a week, a week and a half, and I, felt I was finding myself in my room. Sometimes even my wife was going to bed, and, and I was on my knees, and I was crying out with an open Bible for God to baptize me or fill me with the Holy Ghost. Then I was going out for a walk, and I was praying, Lord, fill me with the Holy Ghost, with the rain beating down on my head. I think people thought I was mad. After that time, my heart that was stone started to turn to putty. And the tears started to flow and there was a presence that used to come into my room and I just knew that he was there. But still the deluge hadn't came. I went back to Whitewell. And I went into a Wednesday night meeting and you know they're seeking meetings. And I thought, I'm not feeling the spirit as I ought to feel it. And I would come out completely and utterly frustrated. I was raging. <laughs> well, Lord, I've been seeking you. Why aren't you coming and meeting with me? <laughs> and a wee, wee, wee lady used to give an interpretation in tongues. She came up to me at the end of the service. She says, son, you've been seeking God, haven't you? <laughs> I said, how did you know? She says, I just know. <laughs> come you into the McGee room with me. I went into the McGee room. She said to me, you know, say banana backwards. <laughs> Take my hands. She says, just speak out what's on your heart. And I said, there, no way. I'm embarrassed. She says, just go. I took that step. And I tell you something, it was like a thunderbolt. Something from the top of my head to the soles of my feet shot through me. And I heard this young man speaking with other tongues. I was wondering who it is. And then come back to myself and realized that it was me. A deluge came my way that night. And brothers and sisters, it wasn't even about the gift of tongues. I want to tell you something. A power came into my life that helped me overcome all the old things that I used to struggle with in days gone by. And all I want to say is this. This empowering is available for each one of us. Would you say amen to that? And I would encourage you, Christian, God is no respecter of persons. If you will do those, take those same steps, if you will do what these men of old did, I tell you, you'll see great revivals, personal and corporate. So the Holy Spirit promotes Christ. The Holy Spirit purifies. The Holy Spirit preserves creation. The Holy Spirit awakens us from the dead. The Holy Spirit helps us to persevere. The Holy Spirit empowers us for service as well. Someone says, Stuart, I don't need more. I'm happy with what I've got. Listen to this quote as I finish from Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, the father of the great Reformed Awakening. And he was saying this actually to cessationists. He 
He said this. Got it all? Well, if you've got it all, I simply ask in the name of God, why are you as you are? <laughs> if we've got it all, why are we so unlike the early church? Got it all at your conversion? Where is it, I ask? That really challenged me, that, that quote. Got it all at your conversion? Where is it, I ask? Brothers and sisters, when you go out of here this morning, if you take anything away from what I've said, if you forget anything, remember this. It's a person that we need. Would you say amen to that? God, the Holy Spirit. Thank you for your attention. Let me pray and we'll hand it back to Gary. Father, I thank you for the leader of this church. I thank you for the men that he's got around him as well. Lord, I pray that well, Father, I thank you for him, first of all, and I pray, Father, that what he pursues, you would continue to fill, you would continue to inspire him. And Lord, I pray for this church, and Lord, we believe that you've already began local revival here, but would you continue it, Lord? Lord, in an age when, oh, Lord, even the church is going after other things, we come back to the book of Acts. We tell you, Holy Spirit, that we want you, that we need you, that we're willing to do what you want us to do. But would you come with power and would you send revival again? So Father, bless this church from the leadership down and use it in the days that lie ahead for your own honor and for your own glory. And Lord, for individuals, even as they go home today, may they know that there's much more, much more. There's rivers for them to swim in in God. I ask these things in Jesus' name for its glory. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thanks very much.